We'll go to questions. We'll start with the, the Wall Street Journal in the third row on the far left here, please. Thank you, Dan Michaels with the Wall Street Journal. Um, first, about the spending by members. When will you release the 2024 numbers? You, know, you said two-thirds of members, and you'd already given the European aggregate. i um, curious when you'll give specifics on that. And second, in terms of increasing industrial production of, of weapons and other systems, uh, this is a common objective of both NATO and the EU. The EU has a, a summit on this next week. Can you talk a bit about the cooperation? Um, there's been you know, some friction over the years between NATO and the EU. Uh, are, you, are you coordinating better now? And, and what do you see the EU bringing to the table in, in what they're able to do in terms of coordinating and promoting uh, military production? Thank you. So first, on the numbers, we follow the same uh, procedure every year. Uh, when we uh, 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 launch or present the annual report, as we do today, we present detailed numbers for the last year, for past year, because this is the annual report uh, uh, for 2023. And you can look into the report and you will see detailed numbers for defense spending, uh, 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 aggregated, but also um, uh, for each and every uh, ally and development over time in uh, current, but also fixed uh, prices. Uh, uh, then uh, what we have now are only uh, our preliminary estimates for 2024. Uh, we will have better and more data uh, when we publish uh, a report um, uh, ahead of the summit in July. Uh, so exactly when we publish that report is not yet decided, but it's something we publish in, in the summer, and now it will be published at least before the summit uh, mid-July in Washington. Then you will have, uh, and we all will have, more detailed numbers, um, uh, uh, partly because uh, uh, then we have all the decisions, or at least more decisions, in NATO allied capitals. We know that some allies are actually now making new uh, budget decisions for 2024. We have also more uh, reliable estimates for GDP. And of course, if we are not only looking at defense spending, but defense spending as a percentage of GDP, then what matters is both spending, but also GDP. And uh, by summer, we have more credible estimates for GDP. So yes, we have some preliminary estimates uh, 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 saying that uh, <coughs> that uh, we, we uh, also expect uh, two-thirds of allies to meet the 2% target uh, in 2024. Uh, adding it all together also uh, uh, shows clearly that uh, uh, if you put European allies together, they together spend 2% of the GDP on defense. Uh, but we all have to wait uh, until we have more detailed information about each and every country uh, to have the detailed list presented uh, later this uh, year. Um, um, and I hope that, of course, the numbers will uh, uh, further improve by uh, the Washington summit. Uh, yeah, just actually today, Norway announced uh, that they will meet the 2% guideline this year. Uh, 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 so that's yet another example of how allies are constantly adding and adjusting their budgets. Uh, so by uh, July, we have then uh, all these new announcements put together in the uh, new report we will present then. Um, <clears throat> then on uh, defense investments. So first of all, NATO has been calling on European allies to increase investments in uh, production uh, for years. Uh, and of course, the only way to increase defense production is to spend more. Uh, and NATO's kind of main message to all allies, but in particular European allies, is that we have to spend more. And in the beginning, it was a bit hard to convey that message. And now I feel that uh, allies understand. So allies have really started to uh, increase spending. And therefore, they can also, uh, 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 also make orders and, uh, and, uh, and ensure that the industry is investing and providing more ammunition, more equipment, and investing in new production uh, capacity. So we see uh, things are moving in the right direction because they follow the NATO advice, spend more. Uh, second, I welcome all efforts, and we are in close contact with the EU. I met recently with uh, President Ursula von der Leyen. We discussed this in detail, uh, and our staffs are, are also uh, engaging uh, closely. Uh, um, so we welcome efforts by the European Union when it comes to overcoming the fragmentation of the European defence industry. 
um, uh, in the United States, they have many, many battle tanks and one type. In Europe, they have fewer battle tanks and many different types. So, of course, the cost per unit goes up uh, and becomes uh, expensive to, to educate, to train, to, 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 to produce spare parts. Uh, all that becomes so much costly because we have a much more fragmented defense industry. So, all efforts by the European Union to uh, overcome the fragmentation of the European defense industry uh, will be good for NATO. It's something NATO has been calling on, and I welcome EU efforts on that. What is important is that, of course, NATO is the organization that had to set the capability targets. You cannot have two systems setting two different sets of capability targets for the same countries. You cannot have EU and NATO presenting uh, uh, to Germany or to, 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 to Denmark or to Poland two conflicting lists of capability targets. So defense planning, including setting the targets for how many battle tanks, how many planes, how many ships, what kind of readiness and so on, has to be set by one and only one institution. And, and that's NATO's core responsibility, defense planning and the associated capability targets. So, of course, that defines the needs, the demand. Uh, and with the money, you can then turn that demand into uh, real contracts. Second, of course, we need only one institution setting the standards. So, NATO standards for interoperability, for communications, for, for interoperability, for interchangeability of ammunition, all of that is only one set of, of standards. You cannot have two sets of standards. Then you, then, then, then you achieve the exact opposite. Uh, and, of course, uh, EU allies represent 20% of NATO's total def defence uh, expenditure. So, so, again, since NATO represents 100%, NATO has to set the standards. So, standards, defence planning uh, is, is, is core NATO tasks um, and cannot be duplicated because then, then we actually undermine our security. And thirdly, NATO has also had a very important role to play when it comes to joint procurement. That has been done in many different formats, and we welcome different formats. But of course, the NSBA, the NATO Support and Procurement Agency, has for decades tried and tested procedures for big joint procurement uh, decisions, uh, reducing the cost, aggregating demand, and giving the industry the long-term multi-year uh, 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 demand they need to make the necessary in, in investment. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so it is important that, uh, of course, EU focus on uh, the areas where they actually add value to NATO, but not to compete with NATO when it comes to core responsibilities as defence planning, standard setting, capability targets, and uh, we still need uh, a lot of joint procurement uh, conducted in the uh, NATO framework. Go next to uh, Rai Italy in the second row in front of me here, please. Secretary General, Marie Lucrezio Rai, what are your expectations on the upcoming uh, elections in Russia, and um, especially now, because uh, President Putin said that there is a, a possibility of uh, deployment of troops along the border in Finland. Thank you so much. Free and fair elections are core to any democracy, and elections in Russia will not be free and fair because we know already that uh, opposition politicians are in jail, some are killed, and many are in exile. And uh, actually also some who try to register as candidates have been denied that right. So we can say actually before the elections that, that they will not be free and fair, because to have free and fair elections you need competition, you need, you need different lists, you need, you need uh, an open discussion, and you need a free and independent press. There is no free and independent press in Russia. Um, uh, media outlets uh, are suppressed uh, or expelled. President Putin has held power in Russia for decades. Uh, no one expects um, Russia's elections this week to uh, bring any change in the Kremlin. And of course, Russia's attempts to organize any part of an election in occupied regions of Ukraine are completely illegal, violating international law. 
And during the last elections in 2018, the OSCE, they uh, monitored the elections and stated clearly that restrictions on fundamental freedoms and candidate registration resulted in a lack of uh, genuine competition in the Russian elections. And there are no reasons to believe that this has improved since 2018. On the opposite, it's uh, even less uh, open and free now than it was in 2018. Um, so the right to participate in fair and free elections is a fundamental part of any uh, democratic society. But Russian citizens cannot count on uh, freedom and fairness uh, because uh, opposition politicians uh, are dead, in jail or exiled. And the press is not free. Uh, then uh, briefly on Finland. Finland is safer now than before they joined the alliance. Because now Finland is covered by our uh, collective defense clause, Article 5, one for all, 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 all for one. Uh, almost all the Russian land forces are uh, engaged in the war of aggression against Ukraine. So we don't see any imminent threat against any NATO ally. Uh, but of course we will monitor, follow closely what Russia uh, does along NATO borders. Uh, but NATO has been able to protect NATO allies for 75 years and will continue to do so, including with Finland as a member. Go next to the uh, Ukraine National News Agency in the fourth row here, please. Thank you so much, Dmitry Skulko, National News Agency of Ukraine. You mentioned many times the strategic importance of the Black Sea area. Uh, during a year, Ukraine succeeded to destroy around 25% of the Black Sea fleet. How that situation uh, impacted uh, the strategic stance of the Black Sea uh, area? And uh, are you going to reinforce uh, the coastal states, uh, NATO members, uh, to finally get rid from a Russian dominance in the area? Thank you so much. One of the big victories that um, Ukraine has achieved is actually to be able to push back the Russian Black Sea fleet, fleet um, and to destroy many of their ships uh, and also uh, then ensure uh, the open corridor uh, from Odessa and all the way to Bosporus. Uh, also working closely with uh, NATO allies, littoral states, uh, Romania, Bulgaria and Turkey. Um, and this shows the strength, the skill, the competence of the uh, Ukrainian armed forces, but also the importance of delivery of advanced weapons from NATO allies. So some of the missiles, some of the systems that has been so, cre so, uh, so critical in opening this corridor um, has been, of course, uh, provided by uh, NATO allies. This is important for Ukraine, it's important for the Black Sea, but it's also important for uh, the world because this ensures, enables the export of grain and other uh, commodities, uh, which uh, are extremely important for uh, global food uh, supplies. Uh, we are working uh, closely also with our partners, not, on, not only, of course, Ukraine, but also Georgia. Uh, NATO is uh, helping to train uh, and develop the Georgian Coast Guard. Uh, so, of course, with uh, three NATO littoral states around the Black Sea, uh, then Ukraine and Georgia as close partners. Of course, NATO is very much present in the Black Sea, and uh, the Black Sea is of great strategic importance, and I welcome uh, very much the achievements that uh, the brave Ukrainian uh, armed forces have achieved in pushing back uh, the Russian uh, Black Sea fleet. We'll go next to the Telegraph in row three in the middle here, please. Hi, Joe Barnes from the Daily Telegraph. Um, one of the sections looks at the threat posed by hypersonic uh, missile systems, and it's listed as one of the nine key emerging and disruptive technologies. Um, we know a Patriot system has downed the Russian Kinzel, the killjoy in NATO speak, um, but how much further do NATO's ballistic missile defenses have to go to ensure full coverage against hypersonic threats? Um, and then you also, in the same section, list Iran as a particular worry in this. Um, why Iran? Um, do you see them picking up production further than they already have? Um, and it seems to be a concern that you share with your partners in the European Union. Um, thank you. Hypersonic missiles is, of course, uh, a real challenge. Uh, and it uh, demonstrates that Russia has invested heavily uh, also in more advanced uh, weapon systems. At the same time, 
Um, I think we have demonstrated that NATO has the capabilities to protect uh, and defend against uh, Russian hypersonic missiles. Uh, when they were launched, the Kinshal was launched uh, some years ago, it was uh, 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 accompanied by a message from President Putin that these uh, missiles were not able uh, to protect against, uh, not able, uh, that, that we were not able to, to shoot them down. Uh, we, NATO, so Ukraine, has, uh, by using uh, Patriots demonstrated that that's possible. Uh, they have been able to shoot down uh, uh, several hypersonic uh, Russian uh, missiles. Um, but it demonstrates also the need for a layered air defense. Uh, it demonstrates the need for uh, air and missile defense. Uh, and it demonstrates the need uh, for uh, not only high quality but mass. Uh, because one of the strategies we have seen in Ukraine is of course to try to overwhelm the air defenses by sending in a lot of uh, missiles and drones at the same time. So um, uh, that's also the reason why, as part of our defense plans, as, as part of uh, what we do now to implement the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense in decades, uh, air defense is a, a, a critical part of that effort. Again, this is part about spending more. If you look at <coughs> the um, announcements that our allies are making on what they are buying, many of them are now buying uh, a, a lot of uh, air defense, uh, filling up or following the NATO capability targets, which have focused a lot on, on, on air defense. Poland made announcements uh, not so far ago for a lot of new uh, um, air defense systems. Uh, uh, Germany is leading the Sky Shield Initiative, where uh, several allies have gone together uh, and, uh, and ensuring that they are um, delivering on the NATO capability targets for more air defense. So, so yes, we need to do more uh, because uh, we need the quality, we need the quantity to ensure that we have uh, sufficient air defense to protect against uh, missiles and drones and planes. We have time for a couple more. We'll go to Imedi TV in row three here, please. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary General, you just mentioned Georgia, but still, can you tell us more about the deepening relationship with uh, partner Georgia in this context of war and turbulent times? And what can we expect in July um, in the context of future membership? Thank you very much. So Georgia is a uh, valued uh, NATO uh, partner. Um, uh, we... Uh, strongly believe that Georgia has the right, as all other European countries or countries, to, to choose their own path. Um, uh, I have visited Georgia uh, several times. Uh, I will visit Georgia in the near future again uh, to further uh, uh, strengthen our partnership and look into how we can work uh, closely uh, to, uh, together. Uh, my message to Georgia is, of course, that uh, reforms uh, are important uh, and that uh, NATO is based on some core values, democracy, the rule of law, and it's of course important that Georgia um, um, live up to these standards uh, as it moves towards uh, further Euro-Atlantic integration. We have time for one more. We'll go to Reuters in row three here, please. Andrew Gray from Reuters. Uh, Secretary General is very struck by the line um, that you mentioned earlier that Ukrainians are not running out of courage, but they are running out of ammunition. So really a very simple question. Why are they running out of ammunition given they have the support of so many allies, so many powerful economies? Does this represent a failure from NATO allies? NATO allies are not providing Ukraine with enough uh, ammunition uh, and that, uh, that has consequences on the battlefield every day. The fact that uh, the Russians are able to outgun uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainians every day, of course, is a huge challenge. It's one of the reasons why the Russians have been able to uh, make some advances on the battlefield over the last uh, weeks and, uh, and, uh, and months. And, uh, uh, and therefore, it is uh, an urgent need for allies to make the decisions necessary uh, to uh, step up, provide more ammunition to Ukraine. Uh, and that's my message to all capitals. Of course, we all follow very closely the process in the U.S. Congress, uh, because the U.S. is by far the biggest provider um, of weapons and ammunition to Ukraine. At the same time, my message to the United States is that they, they are not alone. European allies and Canada are also providing significant support, uh, uh, but both uh, uh, US, Canada and Europe has to do more, and we need long-term commitment. 
um, to enable the Ukrainians also to plan. Uh, then uh, this is, uh, of course, we have the capacity, we have the economies to be able to provide Ukraine what they need. This is a question of political will uh, to take the decisions and to prioritize uh, support for, for Ukraine. And therefore we need the decisions to uh, invest more in uh, defense industry. Uh, uh, we need to ensure that uh, our governments uh, are um, agreeing contracts with the defense industry so they can make the commercial decisions to scale up production. And of course we need the will from all allies to then allocate um, um, support, um, ammunition, but also other types of military equipment to Ukraine. It has been unprecedented what NATO allies have provided, but, uh, but, 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 but we need to continue and we need to step up, and that's the message. That concludes this press conference. I know we didn't get to all the questions, but the conversation can continue. It's now our great pleasure to invite the media to a reception upstairs in the Compass Room. The press team will be here to guide you there. The Secretary General will join you in a few minutes, and we look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. See you.